Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld Extreme Desert Challenge. In the last episode, the steakhouse saw quite a bit of action. We tested out our defenses against raiders, helped out a crashed Imperial shuttle, and also took care of a large group of man-hunting cougars. During the episode, we also bought and sold a few animals, and unfortunately, one of those had already bonded with Troy here, which has now resulted in a rather noticeable mood penalty. Now, I knew that this would happen, but I guess I wasn't really aware that it would last for an entire year, so I suppose we shouldn't stress out Troy any further for quite some time. At this point, we can also quickly address this quest we received last time and all of your comments on it, because most of you were in agreement that we should better not take this. Being 62 years old, Orion here could very likely have some age-related ailments, not to mention that her occupation as a paramedic suggests that she is very likely good in the medical skill, and that is something that we already have covered. So, with that being said, let's jump into today's episode, and we start things off immediately with an event in the form of a few crashed cargo pods. Inside, we find plenty of meat, so our dog's kibble supply is secured for a while longer, but the steel from the parts itself is of course also going to be useful, as steel already slowly emerges as our resource bottleneck this series, so we'll gladly grab whatever we can. Wood, on the other hand, is growing nicely, and we have a decent amount at the moment, so let's use some of that to have Jake build himself a dresser and an end table. Not only is that going to improve the comfortableness of his bed, but it will also give his bedroom a slight beauty boost. In the end, we can see the comfort rating has actually gone past the value of 1, and that is partially also because the bed is of excellent quality. Suffice it to say, from here on out, Jake will sleep like a baby. As the day progresses, we can see Redhawk mine some more much-needed steel, Troy and Steak are both busy researching, and Jake is actually doing something about that bad situation now, because an excellent quality bed, so that is something that we should put in our hospital, while Jake himself will have to be content with only a good quality bed. The medical bonuses that the excellent one gives are simply too good to pass up. Now, following that, the rest of our day remains rather uneventful, so we rejoin our colonists in the early evening, and we can see Steak here has only 4 hours left on his creativity inspiration. You can also see that we are not quite done with our research project, which I had hoped to use this inspiration on, so instead we're going to use it on something that was also suggested in the comments, and simply have him build another bed. And to look at that, our very first masterwork item of the series. This is the second highest quality tier in the entire game, only short of legendary. And as you can imagine, the stats of this bed are absolutely fantastic. And because of that, we will once again do some shuffling around here. Edmo's steel bed can be deconstructed to give us some precious resources. Our excellent quality hospital bed can then replace it, while the masterwork bed becomes our new hospital bed for maximum effectiveness. Just before bedtime then, we also have Steak construct two additional turrets. We now have a bit of steel to work with, and this now finally fills up our shooting range. We will of course have to see whether or not that's going to be enough for the next few days, but at least for the moment I think it should serve us nicely. On the next morning then, we start a crafting task for Edmo, because we now have researched flak armor, and in my opinion, all colonists who can wear some should wear some, so let's have him make some for the cost of 30 cloth, 60 steel and 1 component. And while that is going on, our two researchers then unlock gas operation, so we can now craft ourselves chain shotguns, heavy SMGs and LMGs. Again, with Steak's inspiration expired, that is nothing that we're going to do right away, but it's certainly good to have the option. Now, our next project will be biofuel refining, which will allow us to turn plants and trees into chemfuel, but we are not researching this because we need additional power, but much more so because there are a few very useful things in this game that also require chemfuel, things like mortar shells or drop pots, for example. Shortly after then, the flag vest is completed, and this one will go on Jake. Edmo and Steak both already have one, and those three tend to be the colonists who fight the most for us. 
The day then continues with some steel smelting and some mining. Not really a whole lot to talk about, so we might as well skip ahead to the next morning. And on that morning we can watch Edmo bring in another hay harvest. And you can also see that he's doing that with the help of our donkey Froom, who has already been successfully trained in the hauling skill. Froom's companion Tiemo is also ready to go just a few moments later. And so we now have six animals capable of hauling stuff around the base. That is certainly going to make life a lot easier. Apart from that though, the day remains rather uneventful. And so, for the sake of expediency, as a certain Matthew Mercer would say, let's speed things up a bit and return to our colony on the morning of the next day as Steak finishes researching biofuel refining. This means we can now construct a refinery, and we'll do that in just a moment. First of all though, let's lock in mortars as our next research project, because I have a feeling that our first siege is only getting closer, so I think it can't hurt to have some longer range defenses. For 150 units of steel and 3 components, we will then construct ourselves a biofuel refinery outside here. As far as I'm aware, this thing does not suffer from any work speed penalties if it's put outside, and our two workshops are getting a little bit crowded anyway. Once the construction is finished, we will also immediately start making our first batch of camp fuel, and this requires 70 units of plant matter, in our case rice and potatoes, which I think we can spare at least from time to time. This then produces 35 units of highly flammable chem fuel, which is actually not that much, especially things like mortar shells require a hefty amount, but you have to start somewhere. Now, since chem fuel can be a bit volatile, if you will, it might make sense to build a separate small storage area for it, and we'll do that very swiftly right inside of our already existing one. And yes, storage space is getting a little bit sparse at the moment, so we should probably be looking to increase that soon, or to perhaps decentralize it a bit further. Which actually brings me to my next point, because I think that our hospital could be designed a bit more space efficient, so let's quickly take care of that. After shuffling a bit of furniture around, we now have our hospital bed right next to the entrance, and we have room for a second storage shelf, which we can use to finally store all of our medicine in one place. Something similar now also happens to our cloth stockpile, which can at least partially move a bit closer to our tailoring bench, and therefore becomes a bit more accessible as well. And so another evening rolls around and we receive the message that Orion has sadly been lost, but again the risk was very likely not worth the reward, and I feel like our kindness has to have its boundaries if we want to survive. Just a few moments later then we are visited by a trader with a rather intriguing name, maybe some of you know what I'm talking about, so let's see if Giraffe here has something interesting to sell. Right, so there is really not a whole lot that we can do here, but we are going to sell some herbal medicine to grab all the silver that Giraffe has. And yes, I know, I normally say that you can never have enough medicine, but thanks to hydroponics we can quickly grow more whenever we need it, and we have so much of it at the moment that I think we can afford it. Now on the next morning, let's quickly take care of something that has been bothering me for quite some time. Jake's icon up here needs to go all the way back to the end, Apart from poor Alistair, he was the last guy we recruited, and I have to admit, even after hundreds of hours in this game, I only now realize that you can actually rearrange this. The morning then has Redhawk harvest the next batch of psychoid leaves, and so, just a few moments later, we can watch Troy make more flake. And we now also have a separate stockpile for psychoid leaves as well, once again, just to ever so slightly increase production speed. The next harvest is then due on our cotton field, and this one is actually taken care of by Jake, Redhawk and Edmo, but that only means that it's completed quickly. And since we have nothing better to do, let's actually use some of that cloth now, more specifically to make a few corsets. I have ran the numbers, and these are by far the most profitable clothing items in the game. The downside is that they also take the longest to make, but again, we are not terribly busy at the moment, so let's order 5 of these and send Edmo to work. 
And just in case you're wondering, we will of course use these as trade goods. As far as I know, they can only be worn by female colonists anyway. But as long as Red Hawk does not have any royal titles, that is absolutely unnecessary. In the evening, we then have another group of travelers pass by, but this time they unfortunately do not have anything to trade, while Edmo finishes his first corset, which is then immediately hauled into our storage room thanks to one of our huskies. On the next morning, business continues as usual, with half of our colony enjoying themselves in our potato field, before everyone goes back to work, and really that is about all that happens. And again, I hope you are okay with me kind of rushing through these more uneventful days. I wanted to use this episode to try out a slightly faster pace, which is of course only possible if we don't have too much happening. But for the time being, things are quiet, so let's make some progress here and jump ahead to the next event, because in the middle of the following night, we have a slaver caravan arrive. As they arrive at our base a few hours later, we can then see that we will unfortunately not be making any major trades here. A single boom rat is not the type of animal that we are looking for currently. And unfortunately, both colonists that are for sale here are simply too expensive. Additionally, Whale here does not really offer a skill set that we desperately need at the moment. While I was actually a bit more intrigued by Tony, minor passion in crafting and arts that could fill a need down the line. But again, we don't have the necessary funds. So all we can do is sell our flake for a small profit, and then wait and see what the new day has in store for us. And that day actually surprises us with another quest a few hours later, as we are being asked to destroy a pirate camp. Four pirates need to be taken out in order to do that, and while none of the rewards here get me overly excited, we will of course also have the option to loot the camp itself, and even in a small camp like this with only four enemies, that could be pretty lucrative. However, we will not embark on the journey just yet. For the time being, we have enough steel to construct three more hydroponics basins. And you guessed it right, we will use those to grow even more drugs. We will also use our force of animal haulers to bring a bit more limestone towards the base, because, well, it's a versatile building material, and I think it can't hurt to slightly increase our stock. In the early evening, we then once again have cargo pods crash down, or more specifically, one single cargo pod, and inside we find four components. Nothing terribly useful, but of course we'll take it, just like the steel slag chunk right next to it. But I will admit, I had hoped for something a bit more valuable. Now, before the night fully sets across the desert, we have one more crafting task to complete, as we will now have Edmo make a flag helmet. At the moment, all of our colonists are wearing something that I would not really call protective headgear. Most of it serves as heat protection, but a cowboy hat does not really do anything to stop bullets. So for the first time in this series, I believe we will now be using some of our plasteel alongside some steel and some components to make our first true helmet. And while that is happening and the rest of our colony is already fast asleep, another quest pops up and it looks like once again, someone is looking for some laborers. Now this time they only need one able body, but still I think we will skip this one. A goodwill gain with a faction that over time will default back to being hostile with us is not really worth much in my opinion. Not to mention that we would be losing a colonist for 10 full days, which would not really work that well with another plan that we have. And for that plan, we are actually also making this flag helmet here, which as you can see turns out to be of excellent quality, which I had honestly not expected, but of course it's much appreciated. Before Edmo goes to bed himself, he can also quickly make a second bedroll, because on the next morning we will do some traveling. First of all though, we have to accept the quest here to learn exactly where we have to go, and we will do so for the most valuable loot, which includes a side trainer and a hand talon. The pirate camp location is then revealed to be quite some distance away, but a small section of road runs between here and there, so travel times should be manageable. Now on this mission, we will be sending out the dynamic duo of Jake and Stake, who can now both get combat ready. 
Stake will equip a flak jacket, as he will likely be staying in the back a bit more. Jake, on the other hand, will put on his full suit of marine armor, as well as the brand new flak helmet. As part of the caravan, we will also have the two of them be accompanied by our two alpacas, Bradley and Modified, because if things go smoothly, then we will be able to dismantle the pirate camp, and I imagine we will need a bit of extra carrying capacity to bring all the good stuff back to the base. Now, in terms of supplies, we will bring two bedrolls and some quality medicine. Neither Jake nor Stake are overly proficient in the medical skill, so some good medicine should help them more easily patch up any wounds. Since the trip will be quite long, we will give them plenty of meals as well as 200 units of hay for the alpacas. Let's just hope that the alpacas actually eat that and not the meals meant for our colonists, which is something that I have experienced in the past. But again, the journey here isn't too long, so we should be fine either way. And just a few moments after our small caravan has left the map, they immediately run into trouble, as they are being ambushed by a pair of manhunting raccoons. But with a small safe zone to keep our alpacas out of danger, we can send our colonists out to meet the enemy, and well, the fight goes about as one would have expected. So, moving on, our caravan continues their journey, while back in the base, we first learn that our donkey Froom is pregnant, and then we encounter a lone iguana that has somehow found its way into our fields, and which will, in just a moment, find its way onto our dog's meal plan. As we watch our caravan's final few hours of travel for today, we are then greeted by a psychic soothe, so Edmo and Troy will now receive a slight mood bonus, but I don't think the radius of the soothe extends all the way out here, so Jake and Stake should be unaffected. A few hours later then, our caravan makes camp for the night, and the steakhouse is already fast asleep as well. On the next morning then, a flash storm strikes the desert, but luckily not too close to our base, and as usual, it also doesn't last for long. And so, while our colony experiences another rather uneventful morning dominated by the potato harvest, our small caravan slowly makes its way through the hills and mountains, and eventually arrives at its destination in the early evening. So, as we can see, the bandit camp is nothing too spectacular. Our enemies are of course patrolling around the area, and there is also a turret to protect it, but the pirates are not too well equipped, so I think we have a decent success chance here. Now, once again, our alpacas will stay back and out of danger, while Jake and Stake slowly approach the enemy base. And on their way over, we can see that one of the enemies is actually out alone and isolated, and it is also a melee unit, so let's see if we can quickly take them out. Alright, perfect. This should already make the fight a lot easier. And with the remaining three enemies now approaching, we will lure them into the cavern here. That offers a lot of nooks and crannies that we can use as cover, while we slowly decimate our enemies. I will admit though, getting Jake tangled up in melee combat this early was not really part of the plan, especially since it also makes it very risky for Stake to keep firing, but eventually Jake manages to break free and our second target falls shortly after. You can see though, Jake suffered two injuries here due to friendly fire, so let's try to avoid making more mistakes like that in the future. With the remaining two enemies pursuing us deeper into the cavern, we can then lay down some crossfire, and since one of the pirates here takes a bit too long to find adequate cover, they fall quickly, and that also causes the last one to flee. We will of course not let that happen, and the kill is confirmed just a few seconds later, and with that the base is pretty much cleared, except for the turret of course. Now we have already suffered some injuries, so I don't think it's wise to take on that turret head first, and luckily we don't have to. Instead, we can easily break our way into the small building here, reveal a dining room area inside, and then break open another small piece of wall, which gives us a clear shot at the battery that is powering the turret. And with the battery destroyed, the turret immediately ceases to function as well, 
And that officially marks the end of this quest, and back home in our base, our payment arrives on time. Now, at this point, Jake has also found a small bedroom, and we can quickly use that to have Steak patch up his wounds, most of which he caused himself. For some bizarre reason, though, he decides not to use any medicine for this, despite having it right here inside of his inventory. So uh, let's just hope that doesn't come back to bite us in the ass later. Now, for the remainder of the night, both Jake and Steak will rest and recover, and on the next morning, we quickly jump back to the base first, where Troy has successfully finished his research of mortars. This means we can now focus on new technologies, and the next one here is a large one, as we will now try to unlock the secrets of geothermal power. I believe we have two or three of these geothermal vents right next to our base, but one of them alone should already be more than enough to solve our energy needs for the foreseeable future. Back at the pirate base, meanwhile, we are doing some deconstruction work. I know that we will likely not be able to bring all of this back with us, but steel, cloth and components are valuable items that should be prioritized. Eventually then it's time to reform the caravan and send them on their way back home, and as you can see we are taking most of the valuables, primarily the weapons and the untainted apparel, and then we are filling up the rest of our carrying capacity with steel, components and cloth. However, we will not send our small group back home right away. Instead, they will make a quick trading stop at the Black Troska tribe. After all, we do have a couple of items that might be worth selling. Back in the steakhouse, meanwhile, another evening has arrived. And with that, we are actually about to complete our 10th in-game day of this episode, which is, again, a slightly faster pace than usual, but at least to me, it felt like it was a good one, and it allowed us to make some good progress. However, for today, I think we can make the cut at this point. As always, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, then I would of course be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so already, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.